Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. My name is Nick Khan, and I'm pleased to host today's export market update on behalf of Wine Communicators of Australia. This is, in fact, the second of two webinars on exporting wine that WCA is presenting in partnership with Wine Australia. Last month, we looked at the range of support services that are available to new and current exporters from organisations such as Austrade, EFIC, and Wine Australia itself. Today, we're taking advantage of the fact that all four of Wine Australia's heads of markets are in Adelaide together to specifically look at what's happening in their parts of the world. And that also explains why WCA is running this webinar on a Friday rather than the usual Tuesday. With me here in the Wine Australia offices are Laura Jewell, MW, who's head of market for Europe, the Middle East and Africa, based in London. Aaron Ridgway, who covers North America from offices in San Francisco. Willie Yang, who's head of market for China, based in Shanghai. And Hiro Tahima, who is responsible for the rest of Asia, working from Sydney when he's not on the road. Our overseas trio have been in Australia for a few days now, and the four of them are in Adelaide for a range of meetings, and early this week presented at export workshops. So today, they'll be picking up on some of the themes from those presentations. Laura will update us on the UK market post-Brexit. Aaron will tell us the moving story of Shiraz in the US. Willa will look at online developments in China, and Hero will focus on South Korea. And then they'll also make some general observations and comments about what they're seeing on the ground in their markets. And they're here to take any questions you might want to throw up. We'll take some after each individual presentation, and maybe, if time allows, some more at the end. So if you would like to ask a question, that is pretty simple. Just use the chat box on the screen in front of you and hit send, and I'll feed them through to the panel as they arrive. To any of you who have participated in WCA webinars before, yes, things might look a bit different on the screen because WCA has moved to a different delivery platform with the support from Michael Downey at the AWRI. Hopefully you can see and hear us okay. We've had a few technical issues in the warm-up, but we're on a roll now. And of course, as with all WCA webinars, you will receive a copy of the slide deck and a link to view the session again at your leisure later this week. So let's get things underway. And I'll ask Laura first to give us the view from London. Hello, everybody, and uh, greetings from the UK and Europe. Um, I'm just quickly going to run through a little bit of background on Brexit and um, where we're at. I know that it is changing on a daily basis, as we heard this morning, that um, the, there has been a challenge to Brexit and the decision in um, the UK. So some of the timings that I come on to may be a little upset depending on how much uh, the UK government decides to fight the High Court ruling this morning. Hi there. Sorry again to interrupt you there, Laura. Nick, we were seeing your slides there for a moment and now they have disappeared again. Can you just make sure that you've got show your screen clicked? in the sharing part of your control panel. I've had a few comments from people saying they can't see the slides. The audio is coming through fine. How's yep. that? That's good. Thanks very much. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I almost subtitled this presentation, and in fact I think I did in, on Wednesday, as a bit of a stop the world I want to get off. Rarely has there been so much upheaval, uncertainty, and not knowing what is round the corner. When we go back six months, the UK market was pretty stable. The recent declines had slowed, and there was growth in the retail sector, particularly among the grocers. The Aussie dollar had settled at about 195 to the pound and I actually finally knew how much budget I would get in Europe, however meagre it might be, but at least I knew how much there was, and I booked a holiday. Per capita consumption had reached a pretty good level of 24.9 litres per um, adult, and the adult population of the UK is 51 million, of whom 28.2 million, or 55%, are regular wine drinkers. By regular, we mean at least one times once a month, which makes me pretty regular, I have to say. And if I can dare mention it, we had a, a buoyant English wine market, um, particularly around sparkling. And I really only mention it because it means that wine is being discussed and is hitting the headlines. To put it into context, Champagne produces 350 million bottles every year. 
English sparkling wine has reached the dizzy heights of 5 million. So I don't think we have too much to worry about just yet. But it is a big market and there were clear signs of trading up. And then the 23rd of June happened. We voted to leave, just 51.9% of us and 72% of the, of the population turned out. So the aftermath. It was very clear that the UK government had not actually planned for this outcome and David Cameron resigned. One overwhelming effect overnight was the weakening of the pound. And suddenly there was panic and uncertainty over the economy. Predictions of a financial crisis, of the FTSE 100 index dropping, of pricing of housing wobbling, all of this happened. There were big concerns about immigration. We see a lot of uh, photos of uh, immigrants in, by the boatload off the coast of Italy and Greece and it became a real issue. There was also panic around the brain drain and financial, financial services in particular to um, exit the UK immediately and move to Ireland and other places. But it was agreed that the priority is to get the most complete and open agreement with the EU. Whether this is their priority is another question. So quick return to currency impact and you can see what happened on the 23rd of June. The Aussie dollar fell, the, sorry, the pound fell off a cliff. It went from 196 on the 23rd to 183 on the 24th. And when I left last week was floating around, somewhere around 160. That is a swing of about 18%. This has more implications than just the obvious the cost of manufacturing and supply chain will increase all the way through the logistical chain. And importers and retailers who might have had he currency hedging are now coming to the end of their cushion. So what will go up? What will happen now? When will prices go up? Naked Wines have already put up their prices to customers, but Majestic have not. And I know you've all heard of Vegemite, but have you heard of Marmite Gate? Well, two weeks ago, Unilever, who own many of the brands such as Marmite, Dove, Hellman's Mayo, Pot Noodle, sought to put prices up to Tesco by 10%, and Tesco rejected them and took the pro products off the shelf overnight. The fury provoked its own um, Twitter hashtag and headlines such as Marmite Gate leads to Marmageddon mm -hmm. and other ridiculous things. But seriously, um, the retailer rejected the pricing and the public opinion was very much on the side of the retailer and not the brand owner. So there is the big question in that of who actually takes the pain. Very few of the big retailers buy in Aussie dollars, which means the pain is with you, the supplier. This is quite different for suppliers in the EU because most retailers will be buying Exceller in Euro. But that means that the buyers of those companies, the, the retailers, are now sitting in front of their suppliers asking for cost reductions. And the final implication of this is that the price of wine will go up. And the WSTA, the Wine and Spirit Trading Authority in the UK, um, claimed that prices are likely to increase by 29p per bottle for European wines and 22p per bottle for non-European wines. So dependent on what happened this morning, um, the timing was going to be that Article 50 would be invoked by March 2017. That is the bit that may be delayed. Then we have a two-year negotiation with the EU and we would exit by March 2019. But we have to remember that there are European elections in France, Italy and Germany for next year, never mind what happens next week in the US, all of which can have major impact, particularly on currency. So what is Australia's role? Well, actually, it's very positive. Um, Australia is seen as a role model for creating FTAs with other countries. And the WSTA in the UK and various bodies, including Wine Australia, have already been in contact and in discussion about using um, Australia's FTAs as a model and also the regulatory um, opportunities. So. Um, I had a meeting recently with Raymo Moretta from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade who came over to the UK. He was on a scouting ex expedition 
to identify what memorandums of understanding there were and what agreements already exist and what needed to be scoped out. And he will be reporting back to a cabinet meeting on the 21st of November. So at a very high level, Australia and the UK are talking not just about wine, but about across the whole um, of agriculture, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we're in a very strong position. And it's also a chance to um, renegotiate quite a number of, of areas, including potential changes to legislation. Steve Guy at Wine Australia is the, is the man to talk to about all of this, but I think we could come out of this really strongly. So that's it on Brexit. At the moment, the feeling in the UK is very much keep calm and carry on. I've got a few slides on the markets, which I will whiz through. So some export numbers, um, not quite sure why the UK market is in US dollars, but it's 23 billion US dollars and it's a big mature market. Australian exports are currently down slightly, but that's mainly in the bulk area and we have seen an increase in bottles. And you can see for yourself some of the grape varieties and growth trends uh, that we're seeing in the UK. For me, the UK is still positive. It is a question of keeping calm and carrying on, but it, we are seeing the decline slowing. There has been a lot of consolidation in the supply base recently, particularly with conviviality, purchasing, um, Bibendum, PLB, Matthew Clark, and Wine Rec. We have seen the reduction of ranges in the retailers, but that again has um, bottomed out, and they are actually all agreeing that they need to focus on premium parcels. There is some confusion amongst customers with the changes to promotion formats, whereby the move to everyday low pricing has really just taken the understanding of what value is for a bottle of wine away from the consumers. They are completely, completely confused. Some of the big retailers are moving to other marketing ideas. So Tesco have recently run a pop-up finest wine bar for two weeks. Lidl had a pop-up uh, off license in the centre of London, Waitrose have just run their first wine and spirits festival, and Majestic are offering um, membership of Wine Tasting Club. The move in the on trade, uh, again, still buoyant, but we're seeing smaller lists with fewer wines on, and therefore you have to fight harder to be on those lists. And we're seeing quite a number of the off-trade independent shops now opening up as wine bars, particularly in the evening, putting in enomatic machines and offering a wide range of wines by the glass. And online in the UK is also particularly buoyant. Amazon is putting a, its toe in the water and Virgin and five other retailers are on, rebe on eBay. Sales are up, and it's interesting to see more and more people coming into that area with Aldi launching in January with 132 wines available online. Laura, can I just ask you a question? There was an article in Harper's this morning, which you're actually quoted, um, which basically infers that a lot of producers aren't really prepared for the rigours of the UK, that it's a lot tougher than they think, and they're coming in thinking it's going to be easy and suffering. Is that is that a fair call, or is that a bit harsh? I think it's... A bit harsh. It, it is difficult, but you just have to do your homework, and um, it can take time to break into the UK, but when you're there, it's generally pretty solid. Positive. Yeah, very positive. If we then look at Europe very quickly, so again, um, Australian imports are down slightly, and basically across the whole of other Europe have a 1% market share. But we're working on that. Growth trends for grape varieties, I love the fact that Blau Frankish is in there. I think that's a, a, a large growth in Germany and Eastern Europe. And obviously we're not producing it in Australia yeah. uh, yet. <laughs> It's not on our alternative varieties. Yet. That was a comment from Aaron, by the way, saying yet. <laughs> so I've just come back from our whiz round the Nordics, and we talked to each of the uh, monopoly markets and the monopoly buyers in those markets. So it's pretty buoyant in most of the Nordic countries. Norway is uh, seeing growth at the higher price points, and they're... Um, 
dependence on bag in box is now reducing. Finland with Alco, their monopoly, they're at a very exciting time in their life. They're launching their new online offering in November. They've increased from 5,700 products to 10,000 products on offer. And they are doing a lot of work on profiling their store ranges uh, based on the size and say, sales profile of the store, which they've not done before. For Sweden, the System Belaget uh, continue their growth of low and no alcohol. They have a, appointed their new buyer. She will start in December. And whilst they are still 50% bag in box, that decline has flattened out. And you have to understand that bag in box in Sweden is premium. It is smaller sizes and premium wines. And in Denmark, apart from the duopoly or the, the dominance by the two major retailers, there is also a lot of cross-border trade happening with Germany, which is undermining the figures that we're seeing. Um, and outside of that, there is a very fragmented supply base. In Germany, it's a pretty stable market with large consumption. 57% is imported, and provenance and drink local are a big influence. Um, it's a very fragmented market. It's a bit like dealing with 16 different states, so you really have to choose which city you work in. And in Benelux, again, we're seeing consolidation of retailers. Our hold have just bought Gallengal, so now have a pretty tight hold on, on Benelux. Um, and sadly, the terrorism threat is still having a major effect on tourism following what happened in Brussels last year. And finally, Poland, small but beautifully formed and very interesting. They drink an awful lot of alcohol, but a very low amount of wine. So there's a huge opportunity with an increase in rosé and fruit-flavoured wines and sparkling Prosecco. Generally across Europe, we're seeing quite a big emigration of youth from the Eastern Bloc and a reduction of drinking occasions. Um, but we're also seeing a lot of health conscious decisions being made on what people eat and drink and again as generally the rising use of technology. Laura, a, a couple of questions, one that's just come through from a member of the audience, very general one, what's the best way to secure distribution in the UK? Discuss. <laughs> That could take several hours. Um, <laughs> essentially, you have to know what channel you want to be in, what your ambitions are, um, what price points you want to be at, who your competitors are, and then come and do your research in terms of uh, which companies. I don't have a list of companies who are desperately looking to increase their Australian portfolios, but we know that people are increasing that their portfolio their portfolios. Um, there have been some really good success stories over the last 18 months since I've been in the role. I'm not taking the credit for it, um, but I've, I've heard about quite a number of new wineries coming into the UK market or coming back into the UK market. So th there are still huge opportunities. And the second question is from, from me. In, in the article I referred to this morning in Harper's, you made the comment that the US uh, sorry, the UK has a wider influence for producers than merely sales in that market. Were well, you quoted correctly? Um, and secondly, given all that's going on with Brexit and the effect on prices, is that likely to have a flow on or is it going to be a purely UK thing? Um, so yes, I was quoted correctly. Um, I think Robert Joseph would disagree with me somewhat, but I do believe that at the premium end, and particularly the fine wine market, then the Far East, um, Hong Kong certainly, and the States all look to the influencers in the UK, be they Jancis Robinson or Matthew Jukes or Tim Atkin. Um, the second part about pricing and Brexit, is it going to be a, a UK only thing? Um, it, that's a difficult one that I can't really predict with, without my crystal ball. I think we are in for some rocky times in the UK, but I also think if people do think long term, we shall be fine. Sure. Laura, thank you. Very informative. Let's uh, jump across the Atlantic um, and look at North America. Uh, Aaron Ridgway is the head of market now in San Francisco, been there for how long now, Aaron? Three months. Three months, great. So he's got a handle on it. 
Um, but you'd like to start with a little story about Shiraz, I think. It's a story that you presented at a workshop here in Adelaide just the other day. Well, uh, sure. We um, debating the topics for um, some internal and external presentations for our conference, and uh, it tended to raise chuckles and comical disbelief when I was given the uh, theme of how to make Shiraz more exciting, or exciting again in the American market. Um, I find Shiraz very exciting, many of us do, but as we know, it's undergone some pretty extreme challenges in the Americas and possibly elsewhere. Um, so I did want to get a little bit creative with the issues um, and wanted to put on three slides just uh, some of those issues, but not necessarily numb the audience into an understanding of what they already know. Um, so look, this is just a little bit of a diversion to jump into stuff that's a lot more serious. But you will see, I think the key here is photographed in one dimension. Um, it's been uh, a pretty important uh, element of production to continue to say uh, very simplistic things about Australian wine and Australian red wine. So as pithily as it is, there's kind of an element of truth in that. Um, so into the parallel universe in which I, into which I stepped, um, there is this kind of silent film style uh, wave of seduction, I guess, this um, uh, siren of a gentleman here who's uh, a very nuanced and complex individual is kind of being uh, targeted by somebody that, uh, that is just interested in perhaps one technical quality and he's trying to get his point across that he's more nuanced than that and she's just trying to get under his uh, cloak, uh, cloak, if you will. And then their relationship develops um, but unfortunately she grows tired of what he has to offer and um, becomes a little bit upset that his charms are available to a larger audience, shall we say, and he sort of says, well, commodification can be fine, and she says, I don't accept that. And then in Act 3, uh, thanks to Billy Wilder and Fred McMurray, Barbara Stanwyck, we see it become a little bit more nuanced. Um, Shiraz is, begins to become understood as, as something with perhaps a bit more quality and a bit more um, complexity. Uh, the bit about foul misconceptions, I think we're all pretty across, and the part about quoting acceptable alcohol levels in a negative tone. Um, she, of course, is willing to say that 14.5 is a, either a neutral or positive thing rather than a negative thing. And then, pretty simple, really, that's the end. I think you're wasted in wine. <laughs> well, I will be wasted uh, <laughs> at some point or another. But no, look, um, it, it's a little bit pithy and a little bit outside the box. But I think um, one, of the, one of the things we all labor under is the perception issue. And... Once we dive into that in just a moment, um, I think we we all feel a little bit frustrated by um, you know whether it's somebody picking up a bottle and turning it around and saying, "Wow, fourteen five. What do they mean by that? It's there's a negative connotation, even though they don't do it to Barolo, they don't do it to Priora, they don't tend to do it to Napa Valley. Um, but this simple quoting of the alcohol in the context of an Australian red wine, Shiraz in particular, is somehow negative and. I don't see a lot of people in the US trade picking up a bottle of Mosul Riesling and spinning it around and saying, wow, 6%. And that triggering a discussion around how alcohol in Mosul is somehow uh, an enjeu du jour. So, but anyway, I do think that we're at a crossroads in the Americas, the US in particular, um, because we've seen a, a very big rise and then an extremely dramatic drop off. There is a bit of a feeling that if we can make some very careful and sequenced decisions now as a total category, we can set ourselves up for a more successful future than if we just try to kind of flood the market again and leverage some favorable currency and, and uh, do things quickly. I think we need to think a little bit more long term. Um, quick snapshot of the market here. Um, it is a large market, 42 billion US dollars. I should get that converted to pounds, Laura, for your slide. Um, total market just growing at 2%. Um, the projection is that you'll see an increase of what today is 9 litre equivalents, around 350 million cases, probably getting to the 410s or the 420s within the next five years. So depending on who you talk to, um, price pressures and supply pressures in California in particular indicate that that represents a sizable opportunity for imports. Um, where those imports come from is why I think we need to listen really carefully and read the market because we might be able to grab some market share. Um, if we look at the next slide here, this is um, moving up a level and looking at US total wine business. Um, this is just a super top line read from Nielsen, estimated 
that there are 35 and a bit thousand wine items uh, under 11,771 wine brands. Big market, lots going on at the branded level and at the SKU level. This red part in particular, which is quite a recent development and a little scary, is that the top 10 are controlling three quarters of the wholesaling activity. So the second part of that is if you're an Australian wine company with one of those 10, that's not necessarily a key to success because with between three quarters and two thirds of the total wine market being US wine, it's difficult to get focus if you're inside that uh, top 10 distributor slash wholesaler network. Um, so certainly the pressure is on Australian wineries, Australian suppliers to grab mind share and to give really simple tools to get distributors to be able to focus in a marketplace that's not all that favourable to focus on Australia. Um, half a million roughly uh, ways in which you can acquire wine, 360,000 on-premise channels, 187,000 off. Um, this is a bit obscured by my screen, but at the consumer level, there are some definitions around uh, consumption, several times per year, monthly, weekly, 28 per million per week. Um, so look, it is 330 million people. It's a major wine market, and um, the transition from a far greater number of wholesalers to a wholesalers to a smaller number of wholesales wholesalers is probably the Brexit of the US. If you had to pick the largest issue that people are really facing, and this is great that we're communicating with Australians in this session, was how do I get my wine to the consumer? Well, there are arguably a, an enormous number of channels, but a decreasing number of gatekeepers or category captains to help you make that happen. So is the argument similar to the, the article I was talking about in the UK, that people aren't really targeting it properly, not knowing properly how to get in there and who to deal with? I mean, how do you start in a country with that physical size, let alone, and 50 states, mm -hmm. let alone the figures you've just shown us? Um, I think it starts with uh, having an incredibly clear strategy, and uh, whether it's Wine Australia or um, you really need to sit down with someone that knows the market and translate your objectives into what's uh, reasonable in that market. You'll see some detail on this slide here that you know while $450 million in Australian wine is, is leaving Australia at FOB value, um, you'll see that's a typo by the way, it's above $8. Um, above $8 is $14 million in US and actually Shiraz above $10 per litre in Australia is only 4% of total sales. So we find ourselves in a position where Shiraz is the varietal that we're most associated with. Um, we all want to premiumise the engagement with that Shiraz, don't get us wrong, but at only 4% of sales it's almost 100% of the reputation. People still make that automatic association with Australia being a category that's in trouble and a category that's reliant on charades. A bit like when you say, a family member's just passed, it's that default question, was it sudden? When you see someone, how are you? It's not an interest in how you really are, it's become an automatic, almost a reflexive engagement. So we want to complicate that through um, well, a number of strategies that we have on the next slide. Uh, this comes back to your question. Um, understanding the hurdles uh, is key to that as well. So there is the perception issue, you can have five SKUs that have 98 points from James Halliday and 15 consecutive trophies at numerous shows. But again, the US is, um, is key buyers in the US are quick to point out the category's challenges over the past few years. Um, convincing accounts, uh, we get a lot of anecdotal and statistical evidence that buyers may like our wines and buyers may uh, have very deep relationships with importers and distributors um, and with Australian stakeholders, but they are often making the case that their customers aren't ready to either return to Australia or their customers aren't ready to look at Cabernet from certain regions in Australia that represents a stylistic departure from Napa, which just tends to dominate. Um, this is a huge one, convincing distributors. So with the recent acquisitions or mergers of Southern and Glaciers, um, the expected changes to RNDC and Young's Market, um, the collation of the Chama Sunbelt and uh, Burt's beverage into the Breakthrough Beverage Network. So it, it's becoming, um, we all know what uh, concentrated ownership looks like in Australia from the point of view of getting it to the customer, um, but it, there have become fewer people actually making the decisions and driving the market. And when you're a distributor of small to medium size, 
um, it's very difficult to gain traction alongside of the majors. And you're probably looking at things like New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, Prosecco, and domestic, well-priced domestic wine to try to drive your volume. If gone are the days of you being able to grab an Australian brand, grow it really quickly, and start to grab market share from the competition of those big distributors. Um, and then competition away from wine too. There's obviously domestic uh, wine and then emerging from say Greece, Georgia, South Africa and is, is in a scent. New Zealand continues to be the real success story in terms of total category growth in the US. Craft beer, Constellation bought Ballast Point for a billion dollars last year, putting it into the same distribution network as Corona. So they're really leveraging those relationships um, on the beer front as well. Spirits, while well, we're seeing a uh, deletion of absolute vodka flavors, we're seeing the flavored whiskey category grow uh, at a rate of knots. Fireball, I don't know how, when the last time you had a shot of fireball was, uh, Nick, but that's uh, many, many millions of cases, costs almost nothing to produce and fairly premiumly priced. Um, and then, of course, the marijuana question. Four states, including California, which is 30 million people, um, that already has its own kind of marijuana culture. Um, are looking at legalization and with a billion dollars added to the total marijuana market in the last financial year, um, the idea is that that will not continue to be the pace of growth if states the size of California are added to that uh, pathway to legal consumption. Um, there is still no formal agreement around how financial, finance companies can invest in marijuana businesses under federal law. Um, but that is being debated, debated as well, and that may change. So it's just a th not a threat, but a, an issue for the wine category that I wanted to put there because it will become amplified in significance over time as more states start to allow economic activity in that space. But lots of opportunities. So the currency advantage um, is seen as a natural driver of more Australian wineries uh, looking to either re-enter the market or start to work in the USA. Um, when it suddenly went to $1.07 um, uh, in 2009, 2010, those trading conditions pushed a lot of people out of the market. But now that there's some margin, you know, that's roughly the level of either a winery margin or an importer margin or a distributor margin, that's the difference between 75 cents and a dollar, more favorable trading conditions. Relative lack of awareness, we take our 65 regions and our 2,500 wineries somewhat for granted. Um, but in the US, we trail significantly behind Spain. We only have about a third of the brands that Spain has in market and about one-sixth of the brands from either France or Italy, who are the other two countries that represent the top three. So even though lots of people know who Australia is as a country, they know that the flight's long. They certainly know that we make a lot of wine, generally laid back people, although weak according to Robert Joseph. Um, it, it is rather a small brand set, so we need to do a lot more construction of what Australian wine looks like from a representational point of view. And that means opportunity if the segment is quite small. Uh, increasing interest and support from stakeholders. So we are getting many, many more inquiries about people wanting advice and guidance on how to enter the US. And then brand Australia question mark, I won't spend too long on that, but there is a little bit of ready reckoning with how we go to market, how we promote ourselves as a serious country when it comes to wine. I think the days of putting on a barbie in a cricket match with a distributor sales team are a little bit of the past, and now we're looking to create a more nuanced and more uh, serious engagement with wine. I know we're running out of short on time, so just to quickly talk you through our key priorities um, and certainly what we believe to be the key priorities for the sector in the US. Making Shiraz more interesting, we think, is um, by pushing new varieties and creating additional context for Shiraz. It won't be the case of showing up to an account with a Shiraz and having the buyer roll their eyes and saying, you've fallen off a cliff, pal, what else have you got? We, we strongly believe that by building stories around Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Cabernet, Riesling, we can create a favorable context for Shiraz and get people to pay either new attention or revisit some of those uh, faulty perceptions. Wine Australia being based in San Francisco, we really want to see as many winemakers uh, visiting the market as possible to be able to communicate what the most recent dynamics are and just give them the really key top line talking points for their adventures around the states. If you know Minnesota or New York or Florida or Texas are showing you know, great opportunities. We want to be able to ready people to tell those stories when they get out into trade. 
growing the community, when we are putting on our sort of key trade activities, we're starting to enlist the help of US influencers and try to put our key messages into the frequency of, of highly respected US trade so that it's not just us telling the good news stories, it's the gatekeepers. Um, Again, driving that serious connection to Australia um, through certainly our stakeholders, but our distributors. Um, we've kind of put a challenge back to producers to think about uh, labels and packaging, and if they're interested in uh, information about you know some of the products that are driving and leading in the U.S., we can whether it's sending back samples or sending back label images or information about promotions that are that are succeeding, whether they be from other countries or, or not. Um, I think we've seen through the artisans of Australian wine in London um, how much it can actually resonate when we pick a slightly different theme and really drive it through a multifaceted marketing uh, and event campaign. So we're very keen to kind of freshen up the way we engage with trade in the US and please visit our website and look at our UPAs. We'll have more information about that um, than what's currently up. Um, and then promoting the global context in trade. So I think Australians, are, because of our tall poppy syndrome, are a little bit unable to, to proudly get those messages across about where our wines might be doing well in other parts of the world. So we are trying to package in a slightly more strategic way when Australian wines pick up awards or when you know, some of our winemakers are kind of habitually doing vintages in Burgundy or Bordeaux or in California or Oregon and showing that connection that we have to global excellence. I think it comes down to Wine Australia's key message as being a thought leader and um, our scientific research and our you know, technical winemaking is as good as it is anywhere in the world and we need to tell that story. If we can do that, then that provides the right climate for us to re-engage with Shiraz and and understanding, understand it as a strategic proposition and an opportunity rather than something we need to apologise for, which I think on the ground we are pressured into feeling. Aaron, thank you. Um, lots of interesting content then, and I think America is a market that we haven't been talking about all that much in recent times. A market we've certainly been talking a lot about is China. Um, so we'll uh, pass over to Willa um, to give us an overview of what's happening in uh, her part of the world. Willa, as I said, is based in Shanghai. Um, well, over to you. Yes. Um, so I talk about briefly about the um, China markets and also um, the recently popular online wine markets, plus some challenges and opportunities. So everybody knows um, actually China is a big market with great potential uh, from our point of view in the next five to ten years. Um, because um, you know people are more and more interested in wine as a lifestyle thing. So this is something you know everybody is um, you know have confidence in. Uh, but China is still a very immature market. Um, most of consumers actually do not have any knowledge on wine at all. So they really need guidance and also education on that part of the mm. uh, world. So um, there's a lot of things that we um, as a member of the wine industry that can do properly in China market. Um, so the total market size um, of China uh, in last year is 23 billion US dollars. Uh, it's up 10 percent in terms of volume, um, but it's still dominated by the Chinese domestic wines over 70 percent. But compared to six years ago when I just joined um, Wine Australia, at that time, the market was um, have uh, about over 80% of the market share was actually dominated by the Chinese uh, domestic wine. So you can see there's actually a growing interest in uh, imported wines. And for Australia's uh, performance in China market, um, we have quite good um, results at the moment. So we have 51% up in terms of value to 474 million Australian dollar. And in terms of uh, the market share among all the import wine, we have over 15 to 16 percent in terms of the market share, but it's still a smaller percentage, of course, in terms of the total China market. Um, uh, at the moment, um, reds still dominate the market, as everybody knows, but there's a growing um, uh, 
uh, Boeing increased on price points over 90 uh, RMB uh, per bottle. And for Australia, uh, we are quite um, doing very good in terms of price points. So Shiraz or CAP um, over $10 FOB or plus are increasing a lot. And the most um, uh, favorite varieties at the moment is still Shiraz and CAP and their blends. So um, I mentioned a little bit about the value increase, and there's also a volume increase um, uh, in the last 12 years to September. So 52% up uh, in volume, and we are also keep growing the uh, average value per liter, which is um, I'm almost 6.59 Australian dollar. And in terms of the premium wine or higher price, uh, higher price point wines, uh, we also have um, a big increase, like 63% up for that. Um, price points. So it's, according to my understanding, it's almost one third of the premium Australian wine exports to the world. So it's quite impressive. Um, I want to uh, touch a little bit about um, the online wine market. Uh, the e-commerce in China is booming. Um, you may heard of a, a global festival, shopping festival, on the 11th of November. It is created by actually by Timo.com, which is the biggest B2C online platform. So they created this festival uh, five years ago. They want consumers to spend money on everything online. And it turned out to be very successful. So the last year's figure for Timo, for example, they sold, uh, the sales figure for them is uh, over 91 billion RMB on that single day. So it's very impressive. And for wine, like yesmywine.com, which is the largest online wine retailer in China, they also reported over 40 billion, oh, sorry, 40 million RMB on that day. So a lot of um, things going on on the e-commerce side. So all these actually, of course, um, uh, we have a lot of um, uh, uh, contribution from the China uh, Australia free trade agreement, you know, especially towards um, Australia, including wine. Um, but there's also um, the economy in China. The GDP um, growth is growing healthily and steadily. And also the uh, the China consumers um, are now spending. You know, they they do not want to save their money in the bank, so they're spending a lot. Um, so we we think uh, the market. The market in China has a lot of potential, uh, beca also because you know the wine consumption per capita per year is very low. It's just uh, over one bottle per capita compared to maybe 24 liter um, per capita in, in the UK, and you can see the potential uh, in China. This is just uh, some uh, figures showing how big and the growth rate for the e-commerce um, market in China. So. Two years ago, like 2014, um, it's already over 2,500, almost billion yuan, you know, for that um, e-commerce market. So it's, um, you can see the, the um, cons consumption habit of the Chinese consumer. They're also changing very uh, a lot uh, in that sense. So when you guys are um, doing business in China, you really need to think of uh, the e-commerce entry strategy as part of your business uh, in, in China. And at the moment, um, the, top, the top players in the B2C uh, side are Tmall.com, uh, which, which uh, actually dom dominates the market. So they have over 57% of the market share. And JD.com has also doing very well. So they have a 21% market share. Then followed by Suning, VIP, Goldmay, Downtown, Amazon, and YHD, etc., etc. So um, these are the main uh, platforms that um, Chinese consume buy product from, and including buying wine, from, uh, buying wine from. OK, so what are the challenges in China? Um, uh, it is, like I mentioned, it's just still uh, an immature market, and people have very limited knowledge on why. But again, that actually gives us an opportunity that how we can um, tailor our messages about Australian wine, and how do we can 
how do we deliver Australian wine message better to the consumers? And it is time that we can deliver uh, interesting stories around Australian wine, promoting the, um, the premier image of Australia in this market. And again, of course, uh, language barrier and the culture barrier. Uh, it's not just a, you know Mandarin or this China so big and uh, uh, people have numerous dialect in, in, in China mainland. So the, the difference actually between different regions are also different. So you, we need to understand uh, the culture uh, in, in the market and we have to adapt uh, to, to that culture. For example, Chinese like to bargain, for example, and people don't really understand. And also um, Chinese uh, like to, uh, you know, uh, establish relationship. They think relationship is more important sometimes and then, you know, Pricing. So this is also something we should um, learn. Um, and China uh, has uh, very complicated distribution. They have um, traditional channel like on trade and off trade, and they also have uh, e-commerce online. But they also have non-traditional channels like gifting, you know, corporate purchase. Uh, this is, you know, very uh, China unique distribution. So this is also interesting to look at. And the pricing structure in China is still not very reasonable. Um, importers, retailers, wholesalers, they actually put a lot of margin on the, on the pricing. So um, if you think, okay, I'm selling um, 200 RMB in China, which is roughly $40 per bottle, it's not actually premium. It's still not premium. I mean, it's premium in the sense of maybe Australia contact, but it's not really premium uh, in China uh, because the margins there and the layers of this uh, different margins is is a lot. So this is also something um, we can we should you know be aware of. Um, and uh, there's a lot of great unknown in China. Um, like I mentioned, there's a lot of gifting or corporate purchase or some company just just buy wine and consume the, within the big organization. So we have to find out who is drinking your wine. Um, this this will also help you to you know target your um, market and of course rapidly involving trend, uh, trends every two to three years like three years ago you know online wine markets was still small but look at the wine market now so there's a lot of trends we should um, constantly watch so what are the opportunities in China um, red wine still dominates as I mentioned before, uh, earlier but the white wine uh, Moscato, sparkling wine are growing very fast because at the emergence, uh, the emergence of um, the young generation and also female drinkers, female consumers, um, the growing number of uh, middle class consumers, like um, over 100 million consumers, these are also the, the target group we should look at. And uh, e-commerce, of course, growing rapidly, you know, you have online marketplace, you, you can also have cross-border uh, cross sales through those e-commerce uh, e platforms. Um, the social media now is, is, uh, is a key to a lot of business in, in China because uh, people do not uh, believe in advertising, uh, simple advertising anymore. Uh, peer recommendation, you know, key opinion leader recommendation is, is very vital through the social media platform. Um, retail distribution is still important um, in China. Um, it plays a, a very uh, brand-building role, maybe uh, in a sense, to to the brands. Um, but you know, again, uh, online distribution is is more and more uh, popular and gaining popularity. Um, on trade is more for branding um, because on trade. Uh, the retail price uh, on, on trade channel is very expensive, but uh, the figures says um, during the past several years, um, actually in terms of value, on trade sales um, is actually higher than the off trade sales. In t although the volume is still you know smaller than the uh, off trade sales, so on trade is actually gaining um, growth. Um, Australian wine is very strong um, in the price point of 150 to 500 RMB, which uh, if I convert to Australian dollar is roughly um, $30 to uh, $100. So that's the price point as Australia is strong at the moment in China. And the branding of Australia and the regions are 
as important as individual brands because you know in Australia we have many smaller wineries and you know doing a branding exercise in in China is is very expensive. So working together, you know, promoting the region, uh, promoting Australia in, in general is actually more important sometimes than individual branding. So these um, are the things that I want to just mention today. And thank you. Thank you. Well, just before you go, you may not be able to answer this question. Somebody asked, how did Australian wine perform in the Timor Global Wine Focus? Do you know? Uh, yes, I actually had a, uh, more discussion yes, yesterday mm -hmm. at the uh, export update conference. You know, I spent 30 minutes. So Timor, as I mentioned, is um, the biggest B2C online platform at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, Timor, as a market online marketplace, they actually it's quite complicated. They have independent stores. If like a um, treasury, I can open an independent stores on the Timor platform. But if I'm smaller, uh, if my price point is cheaper, I may go to and if I have a China distributor or partner already, and if I have, if I have stocks in uh, the market, then I can sell through Timor supermarket. Mm -hmm. But if I haven't any stocks um, in the market, I haven't got any partner, but I really want to set up a store in, in China, then you can go through Timo Global. So there are several ways okay. that you know, brands can work around. I think we might have to send some information out to people along with the, uh, along with the link to this presentation, because it sounds like something that's quite interesting but quite complicated. So thank you, Willa. Um, in the time we've got left, can I call him Hero, who's been doing his warm-ups behind me? Um, Hero, take us briefly through what's happening in the rest of Asia and in particular South Korea. Thanks, Nick. Let's see how much we can pack in the remaining seven minutes. And this is a page that's also an attempt to pack a lot in. Uh, this is a summary of 26 Asian markets to which we export our wines. Uh, so the information is, I would say, somewhat diluted in terms of capturing uh, the kind of growth that some of the individual markets have experienced. But for example, uh, Malaysia in the past um, 12 months has experienced a 42 percent, sorry, uh, that's 24 percent growth. And then South Korea, uh, which is today's topic uh, in the past year, has experienced 42 percent growth in value. Um, and also, all in all, the total Australian exports to th this region, um, other than China, is already valued at 362 million Australian dollars, which is uh, just one uh, million dollar Australian dollar uh, above the UK. Uh, so obviously, uh, because of the cultural differences and different levels of maturity, uh, you know, all in all, this is a very exciting region that we should uh, focus upon and then we should uh, try to understand more as we progress. Uh, on that note, um, just as a rule of thumb, and this is more based on my personal possession, but um, I would like to look at Asia, uh, the Greater Asia, uh, and again, because I don't cover the mainland China, so I would exclude China. But in three ways, uh, in three ways we can look at this region. One is uh, there are markets such as uh, Hong Kong and Singapore, which uh, are really um, Australia friendly and there are a lot of expats who understand Australia and there are a lot of Australian products in market. So there is a, a relatively high level of familiarity uh, to Australia or with Australia in those markets. That's one category. And South Korea and also Japan would fall under another category uh, which is also uh, pro-Australia as a country, but they don't know a lot about country, our, our, our country, and also when it comes to wine, there is somewhat, somewhat of a prejudice and we do need to overcome that. And thirdly, uh, there is a, a number of emerging markets uh, which is currently driven by the local people of the Chinese descent in particular uh, due to partly religious reasons for those given markets as well as tourists and expats. So once again, today we look at South Korea. Uh, it's, that country has a population of uh, roughly double the Australian population. So it's a big country, uh, but in perspective, it is one. It is uh, um, about well, so the, the, the Japanese population, for example, is two point five times as many as South Korea. So that's the size of that country. And GDP capita per capita, uh, it's tough to beat the Australian GDP per capita of Australia, uh, but uh, in comparison with Japan, it's uh, nearly on a par, and it's uh, more than double of China. So we can imagine where uh, Korea sits uh, in, in terms of affluence. Uh, 
Uh, some things to note, uh, technically Korea is still at war uh, with ceasefire in place since 1953 and as a result uh, there is still a compulsory two-year military uh, service for men so that um, appears to be some of an overcast in uh, young people's life and someone affecting uh, sort of enjoying life. Um, I was going to say that the Korea, South Korea's growth is rather slow, but apparently, according to the recent presentation by EFIC, uh, chief economist, it's not as bad. However, there is a sense of sluggishness in the domestic consumption and the domestic econ economy. For example, recently Hanjin shipping has collapsed, and uh, all of us know about what, what has been happening to Samsung with this um, a problem with its phone, and the prime minister's friend has just been arrested uh, for leaking information, so they do have a number of issues. <clears throat> what South Korea means to Australian wine, so it, it has a value of 21 million Australian dollars, uh, and average price is 6.52. So the average um, pr unit price of Australian wine going to Asia is 8.51 uh, uh, per litre. Um, therefore, it sits a little bit uh, below that, uh, that average, uh, but it is much higher than $2.93 per litre, which is the global average unit price. Uh, South Korea is currently 19th exporter in terms of value for Australia, 21 uh, in terms of volume, and there is an upside. Even though we are ranked number six in uh, Korea's imports uh, of wine, uh, they only drink 0 0.8 litre per capita and uh, you know, they can drink more. Uh, wine uh, category consists only 1% of the total uh, uh, alcoholic sales in that country. So um, our performance uh, after the FDA, particularly in the last month, as I mentioned, uh, is tremendous, 42% growth in the last 12 months, and then it, uh, to, compare, com to, to be compared with the performance we had uh, one year before the FDA, which was 4%. But looking at the number of exporters, uh, back in 2010, 81 exporters exported to South Korea, and currently 83 uh, exporters export to South Korea. What this means is that a few companies are, are capturing the benefit of the FDA, and then, but you know, a lot more companies should be able to do this. And just in comparison, currently 203 exporters export to Japan, so there is an upside in this area as well. Um, I do need to talk briefly briefly about CAFTA. So um, Korea-Australia trade, uh, free trade agreement uh, entered into force in December 2014. What it has done is to eliminate uh, immediately the 15% import tariff. But there are still three other um, taxes which uh, are applicable to the import of wine. But Australia does now play on a leveling, level playing field as Chile, uh, which is like really good with FDA's uh, deals with a number of countries as well as US and EU. One thing to remind you is that in order to um, um, take the FDA um, duty-free provision, um, the wine exporters from Australia do need to either self-certify the origin of um, your wine or uh, to contact uh, the, either the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry or Australian Industry Group in order to obtain a certificate of uh, origin. And for more information, please contact Wine Australia. And uh, my observation as to what makes South Korea unique, um, I look at South Korea and South Koreans to be very design and brand conscious, and they're open to new things, and they're interested in new trends, um, particularly in the district of Gangnam uh, in Seoul. That's the trend-setting area, and then that's actually the majority of wine purchase and consumption occurs within Seoul, and Seoul is the center of wine sales and consumption in Korea, so that's that Gangnam, uh, very famous for Gangnam style music and dance, um, is a place to watch and you can go there dancing and be part of it. Um, and uh, this is not me talking, but really by talking to a number of Korean uh, wine professionals, and they do say that the, the Korean market, the South Korea, feels about 10 to 12 years behind Japan. And uh, one thing for sure is that um, even though the population of Japan is only 2.5 times that of South Korea, uh, Japan does import nine times as much wine as South Korea does, so there is an upside. But South Korea is very sensitive to price, so uh, and uh, there there are a few reasons according to my observation. So Chilean wine being so popular is because um, there is a general perception that Chilean wine does give a lot of value for money, and then the quality of wine and the style of wine is, is both satisfactory 
uh, it's got a little bit of sweetness and then that happens to, uh, to match the Korean, general Korean palate. And uh, they feel somewhat defensive about their uh, expenditure because uh, they're first of all um, generally uh, resentful of uh, the dominance of conglomerates who um, seem to control their daily lives. And uh, uh, there is a belief that those conglomerates make a lot of profit, so they need to defend uh, themselves against that. And then hypermarkets uh, and the dominance and the reliance of um, dominance of hypermarket and people's reliance on hypermarket is another way to defend themselves. Um, and another issue is that importers currently, so far, they're un rather unsure of the positioning of Australian wines. So when winemakers or wineries show up in, in Korea and then present uh, Australian wines, which sit in the medium price point, and then uh, there needs to be some convincing and education to do. Uh, otherwise, they, they don't know how to position Australian wine, uh, which they currently think that it's still sort of sit along with Chilean wine and then only more expensive. We do have an oppor some opportunities, so we are creating a renewed interest in Australian wine as we have re-entered into this market with more and more activities in a consistent manner, uh, and we are particularly speaking with uh, a group of young and vi vibrant wine professionals, and they are interested uh, in new style and new regions of Australian wine, and, th th and that whole experience for us has been really good and really uh, exciting. Um, and those people, they are open to uh, what we have to, to tell them, and they're open to learning more about uh, Australian wine. And then also the hypermarkets, uh, upon which there is a heavy reliance. Uh, hypermarkets themselves are trading up, uh, and uh, it, they, they have a, a, a large number of SKUs. I believe that there are about 200 SKUs per typical hypermarket, and then if the category is trading up to suit more um, Australian price points, Australian FOB price points, and that's, that's actually really positive. So we are addressing these opportunities through uh, education and uh, testing events and visit programs uh, by inviting influence, influential people from Korea alongside with other uh, Asian uh, wine professionals. But we are also trying to identify promotional opportunities and uh, also trying to work with media. Thank you, Hiro. Um, a lot in that presentation, a lot in all the presentations. Um, I hope everyone uh, listening got a lot out of that. As I said, we'll be making sure we send a copy of the slide deck and a link to see the, uh, the whole webinar again to you um, later this week. Um, a quick plug before we go, our last webinar for the year for WCA is on Tuesday the 29th of November uh, with Ken Chan, the Senior Digital Strategist for Dig and Fish. He'll be looking at content marketing. Um, details coming out soon. Uh, I hope you can join us. Until then, uh, thank you very much and we'll see you again.